Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for our webinar today on spotting disease in fish. So hopefully we have worked out all the kinks with our audiovisual system, and I hope you enjoy today's presentation. For those of you who have not used the GoToWebinar setup before, if you look to the right in your little info box there, there is an area for questions. Um, it's very small and a little hard for me to read, so I will do my best to get to everybody's questions at the end of the presentation. So here we go, spotting disease in fish. So spotting disease in fish can be a very easy and obvious thing when you're dealing with a very large open sore or a large head wound. Sometimes spotting disease in fish can be very challenging and sometimes the distances are so subtle it takes a professional to notice them. And this could be a change in coloration or even just a slight decrease in appetite. Some other examples of disease in fish involve physical signs, such as a change in color, a color different locations on the body where you see wounds and injuries, and what percent of the body is affected by these physical changes. Behavioral diseases uh, can include body position, how a fish holds itself in the water column. This is also to deal with buoyancy. Swimming behavior, if a fish is, say, doing its normal fishy thing and swimming around, or if they're sitting at the bottom and very lethargic. And appetite. Fish, thankfully, are mostly, for the most part, very good eaters. So certainly a fish that doesn't have a good appetite will indicate that there is something behaviorally wrong about that fish and potentially a disease is in process. So we'll start out with the easier ones, the physical signs of disease in fish. So this guy on the right is a was a 16-year-old goldfish named Silverado. He, we thought he might have a tumor attached to his eye, which we do see fairly frequently in older goldfish. Thankfully for him, this tumor was actually in front of his eye and not actually part of his eye itself. So we were able to do surgery to remove this growth here and he got to keep his eye. So some of the physical signs of the disease we see most frequently are ulcers. So this is going to be a loss of the skin and scales exposing the underlying musculature. Often this is in areas along the back and fins where there's a lot of blood flow and a lot of muscles. It is uncommon over the salomic or abdominal cavity, but as as you can see in those pictures on the right, it does occur. Most commonly, we will see ulcers secondary to poor water quality, diet, and stress. Having a primary bacterial infection is very rare. Most of what we're dealing with in private practice is going to be something that's due to water quality. Primary bacterial infections, albeit rare, are most commonly caused in fish that have been exposed to a lot of antibiotics. And this overuse of antimicrobials in tanks and ponds has resulted in a lot of resistant bugs. So as a veterinarian, if we are trying to treat, say, a primary bacterial infection, we need to take a culture and sensitivity reading in order to make sure that we're treating appropriately. Now these two fish on the right here came from the same pond. And as you can see, those ulcers are significantly large. Um, certainly, there's a lot of fluid rushing into the bodies of these fish, and they're very stressed out. Now, these ulcers most likely did not start at this size. It probably started secondary to just one little scale. This pond has had parasitic, parasitic problems in the past. So probably with the itching and scratching, they created a hole where those bacteria were able to root. And this one actually did need some fairly heavy duty antibiotics in order to fix everybody, because this did turn out to be a resistant Aeromonas species. Some of the physical signs of disease also include parasites. So they're the macro parasites, which you can see with the naked eye. And this includes white spot disease, lice, 
and anchor worms. So an anchor worms, when you actually see that little wormy part sticking out, that is actually just the female reproductive organ and nothing else. These guys replicate very quickly, so it pays for them to have lots of little egg babies. Most commonly with parasites, you'll see scale loss and bruising. And this is secondary to flashing. Since fish cannot itch themselves, like we can or a cat or a dog, they will bounce and scrape themselves off things in their environment. So this could be plants, it could be rocks, it could be each other. And usually the bruising will be caused by that skin irritation, which is what has occurred in this picture on the right. This little fish here had a trichodina infection, which is a microscopic parasite, which you cannot see with the naked eye. But Take a little scrape and put it under the microscope, and it's very obvious that this fish is very, very itchy. And trauma. So a traumatic injury occurs very quickly and is usually a fairly significant event. So this could be an open wound, an active hemorrhage with the underlying muscle exposed. This can occur to very aggressive flashing or if you have something significantly pointy in your tank or pond. Most commonly, we see this with predator attacks. It can occur with fish in the same tank if they're very aggressive to each other. Again, this will be environmental, um, excuse me, species specific. The next word is environmental. So what this means is if you have set up a system that is probably not fish friendly, say it's very shallow, you have lots of plants and other ornamentals that are getting in the way of the fish just trying to swim around. Traumatic injuries vary very, very significantly in, in their presentation. Like I said, most commonly we see traumatic attacks from predators in outdoor ponds. So say it's a heron attack, it is very common to see a V-shape attack along the dorsal ridge that will be identical on the left and right side of the body. Raccoons will see claw swipes, so this will be actual big scratches, mostly along the dorsal ridge of the body. Tank aggression, so say we have a saltwater tank that we can just, we can't get anybody to get along, and unfortunately we've had to segregate most of the fish in there. But one little chromis, these chromis are damselfish and they're supposed to be fairly aggressive, we never see him because all the other fish pick on him and keep him in one little cave. So. He is protecting himself from getting nipped and aggravated by hiding. So certainly a fish that is supposed to be out and active hiding could indicate that this fish just doesn't want to go out and play with his friends because he's getting picked on. The koi in the picture to the right is actually a hawk attack. So this is a fairly large outdoor pond with lots of big trees nearby. The owner actually saw the bird come down and take another fish. You can see this fish is still alive and active. However, even when I was cleaning up the algae there, I noticed that his brain was exposed to the water this whole time. And he was acting fairly normal, other than the large, large wound on his back. So these magnificent animals can put up with a lot before you even notice that there's something behaviorally wrong with them. And then there are the spots. They come in a whole array of colors. The most important thing to know is what is normal in your species. Take koi for ex example. There are many different color variations in koi, and these colors can change with age, water chemistry, genetics, diet, stress, everything. So certainly you're going to notice change as your fish get older. If, say, they're moved from one pond with contrasting water quality, you will notice color changes. Uh, here in California, we have a lot of hard water, and that actually causes little speckles, black speckles, to be on a lot of koi that are essentially just mineral deposits in the skin. They're not harmful at all, but they can damage some of those show quality fish. Genetics, just like in people, some people bald prematurely, some people are really tall. Some fish will retain their colors no matter what. And some fish, you look at them funny and they lose all their colors. It's just the throw of the genetic dice. And in fish, there are diet changes. So again, similarly to a person eating a lot of carrots, 
all that aztaxanthin and other um, carotenoids in there can pull out orange and red pigments in fish. So fish diets that are really high in shrimp tend to pull out those same colors, just like a flamingo diet. And then the spots can be specific and nonspecific. So if you look at the picture on the right, this is a koi presenting with carp pox. And these spots here are pretty much pathognomonic or very specific for carp's pox disease. However, there is an emerging disease called Hikui that has almost an identical presentation that's actually up to a pathologist in order to differentiate the carp pox from the Hikui. So again, it can be a little hard to determine if the spots you're seeing are normal or if they're abnormal and you should be worried. Thankfully, this is very easy to take a picture of and your fish health professional can be like, yes, you need to worry about that and we need to get out there right away. Or, you know what, it's probably okay in this fish, we can go ahead and leave it for a while. And then of course, like any other animal, fish will get lumps and bumps. If they're internal within their salomic cavity, so fish don't have an abdomen and a thorax, they have a coelom, it can be very hard to notice um, lumps internally until they're very large. Mostly we'll notice fish that have an asymmetric body shape. And the only way to really get a good idea of what's going on in there would be with an ultrasound. So thankfully we have a great portable ultrasound that hooks up to a tablet so I can bring it anywhere. And it's very easy to look into these big bulges and be able to tell if, hey, this fish just has an asymmetric ovary, which it happens, or this fish is full of fluid and therefore a cyst and we can drain it, or unfortunately this fish has a tumor. So if you do have a tumor, however, what are you supposed to do? So, whoop, video's not gonna play. Hold on one second, we're just gonna bring up our video for today. Whoop. So if you do have a fish that has a salomic tumor, what you're going to do is surgery. And yes, fish can undergo surgery just like anybody else. Um, we have done it several times. However, the most successful procedures are the ones we get to the soonest. So this guy here is going to be undergoing a salomic tumor removal. Okay. Yeah, and usually with these tumors, I try to get them out as whole well as possible. So he will have a rather large um, incision on his stomach, but I just want to try to get this out whole. It actually feels quite liquidy, so there might be a lot of liquid coming out as soon as I. So this is the only solid part that was in there. 
So that is how you do surgery on these solomic tumors. Really, there is no other way this fish will survive unless we take it out. Um, if you have any more questions about fish surgery, please go onto our website, cafishvet.com, and look up fish surgery. We have a bunch of uh, other articles and options there. So back to where we were. So now that we've gone through the physical signs of disease in a fish, we're going to be going through the behavioral signs. Now, these can be a little bit more difficult to pick out. So starting with body position. So normal fish body position, straight up and down, middle of the water column. Yes, fish do have ears. They don't have external ears like we do, but their inner ear sets the horizontal body position. And this can be affected by water chemistry, neurologic disease, stress, trauma, and of course, they can have congenital problems with this as well. Some different swimming behaviors that you might notice as a behavioral sign of disease is porpoising, so like a porpoise jumping out of the water and trying to swim, flashing, like we talked about with the parasite issue, Twirling, so going in a circle, usually the direction can actually tell us more about where the injury is. Lack of tail movement, so if we ever have a fish that say has a spinal injury, we'll actually do a little neurologic test on its back end to see if they're actually able to use their tail or not. And then of course buoyancy, a fish that is negatively buoyant and on the bottom of their pond, or positively buoyant and stuck at the top on the surface. And here's just a short list of possible causes for all of these different swimming behaviors. As you can see, they're not quite as straightforward. Um, a lot of these different issues can cause various behavioral changes. So if you ever notice that your fish is, say, doing one of these behaviors, 
Really, the first thing we're going to tell you is to check your water chemistry, because again, this is one of the most common causes of behavioral signs of disease in fish. As you can see, it's listed at almost all of the categories there. And then if you're not quite sure if everything looks good there, it's really worth it to have a professional come out. So they're able to narrow down these very broad categories that could potentially be causing problems. Unfortunately, just behavioral signs of a disease are not as straightforward as some of the, the physical signs are. And then there's the appetite. So again, this is what we talked about previously. Fish, especially those in outdoor ponds, are going to have seasonal appetites, and it will also tie to their reproductive cycles. So this time of year in California, we have a lot of heavily pregnant breeding female koi. They are going to be the biggest fish and the hungriest fish because they are producing thousands upon thousands of eggs to potentially release into their environment. In order to keep those eggs happy and healthy, they have to eat a lot. They become big bullies and knock everybody else out of the way so that they can get their food. It's very unique to these guys that are in ponds that are gonna fluctuate with the external environments. Certainly if you're breeding fish yourself and you're manipulating their say tank in an indoor environment, it will be very similar. But fish that are say in a kind of just typical aquarium that don't have a lot of seasonal changes, their eating is gonna be the same all year round. Now if one fish you notice the appetite is off, are all the other fish eating? Is this a problem with one fish, or is this potentially a larger pond-wide or tank-wide problem? What is the fish being fed? Is it appropriate? Sometimes fish are very picky, and they don't want the nice, expensive fish food that you got online from overseas. They just want the gross stuff from the dumpster out back. And unfortunately, sometimes you just got to meet them in the middle and try some more foods. So certainly if you have a picky eater, it's worth it to try a couple more options. Um, and it's always important to know how you should best feed your fish. So again, you have some fish that are going to be fed on the bottom of their tank and some on the top. And if you have a lot of aggressive fish in there, you might need to mix up the methods in which they are fed in order to make sure that there's not a lot of competition and everybody is getting the appropriate diet. So again, this is going to be more important for a mixed species tank, or if you do have those really aggressive female koi that are coming after all the little ones, you can spread out the food, mix sinking and floating food, or just feed them small amounts more frequently. If you have any more questions about fish diets, our August webinar will be covering how to read fish food nutrition labels and all about fish nutrition. So how do we as veterinarians and fish health professionals diagnose these signs of disease and figure out what's going on with your fish? So just like taking your fluffy pet to the veterinarian, we're going to be taking a history. And this will include the duration of symptoms. How long has a certain problem been going on? Is it gotten worse? Has it gotten better? Have there been new individuals that have gotten sick? Have there been individuals that have gotten better? And is there anything done to your system just prior to the onset? So did you swap out all of your new filter media? Or did you add a new pretty little plant that's very, very spiky? How many fish are affected with this disease outbreak is very significant. So is it one fish or the whole pond wide of fish? Because if it's going to be a pond-wide problem, we're more looking at a water chemistry problem. And then in tanks that have mixed species, is it one species of fish that's affected or multiple species? Because this will be able to help us again if it's pointing to, say, a species-specific, say, vitamin deficiency or behavioral thing versus something that's in your water. And of course, since there are so many over-the-counter treatments available for fish, the most important part of the history is what treatments have already been attempted? What have you bought from the pet store and already tossed in? I was at an appointment today that had five different types of medications. I'm saying that using quotes, but you can't see it. So one of which is just a really old bag of medicated koi food, which isn't even made anymore. And then there were three products that had no ingredients listed. 
So a lot of these over-the-counter fish treatments don't tell you what's in the bottle. They'll say it's all natural, all vegan, holistic, all that good stuff, but so is arsenic and other fun, terrible, terrible uh, plant chemicals. So if your fish has a problem, please make sure you know what's in the packaging before you give it to your fish. Or just call your veterinarian and skip that. And then from that, we're gonna be doing our diagnostics. So water quality testing, again, the biggest one that we have to deal with. And then we'll look for particular disease screening. So as part of all of my fish exams, we do parasite screenings. If you have a fish that has, say, passed away from this disease, a necropsy would be in order. Basically, this is just the fish version of an autopsy. But since they're not doing it on their same species, it's a necropsy. We have a great pathologist here in California who does nothing but fish and exotic species. So if I ever have a patient that passes away that we really need sampling on, she can go take all the different organs, break them down to microscopic slides, and really get a great idea of what happened to this poor little fish. And organ sampling, which we do for a lot of our aquaculture um, clients, we'll be looking for bacterial and viral samples. And this will usually involve taking a big batch of fish and taking and collecting all their organs into a big pool and sending it up to a disease specific lab up in Washington state that goes through all the bacterial and potential virus problems to make sure that these fish are healthy and safe to sell to consumers. So what is the best way for you as a client to spot disease? So really most important is to be consistent in your care and feeding. So your care is gonna include your water quality management, how you clean your system, how thoroughly you clean your system, and feeding, making sure, again, that it's an appropriate diet fed in an appropriate fashion for that species. If, there, if you notice anything off, fish just may be acting a little odd or there's one that's just totally not right, we always recommend that you check your water chemistry first. This is something that we're gonna do when we get there anyway. And if you have the little values already for us, it'll make our job a lot easier and your appointment cheaper and faster. It's very important that you check each fish daily. So again, this is very easy. If you're feeding them once a day, be able to go out and just put eyes on everybody, make sure everybody's there for one, make sure that they're sitting and swimming appropriately, and then you can check on their appetite as well. If you have any concerns or questions about a spot on a fish, them doing something odd, them chasing a fish they're not supposed to, please ask. We are happy to take any questions, even if you think it's completely ridiculous. I guarantee somebody has asked it before. We are used to having all sorts of fish questions. We understand going on the internet and other forums just don't have the best and most consistent information. So if you have any questions, please, please ask. We do everything with fish and we'll have our information on the very last page. So please write it down and have it handy just in case something does come up. We are happy and here to help you. And that's gonna conclude most of our issues with behavioral signs of disease and physical signs of disease. So I'm just gonna roll through these last couple slides. And if you have any questions, please type them over in the little question box and I will get to them on the last slide. So the next two webinars we have coming up, first one is gonna be July 10th. And this is gonna cover water quality basics. Yes, it's back, it comes every year, it is the most important webinar that I give. So if you've never seen it before, please, please, please come and watch it. And then back by popular demand by actual several fish food companies is how to read fish food labels and nutrition basics. This is going to be August 14th. And again, these are all gonna be at two o'clock Pacific time. Hopefully that works out for everybody. And we're very happy to announce that the third book in our children's book series, Blue and Bubbles, just arrived this afternoon. So if you have any interest in proper fish care for children and families, please check out blueandbubbles.com. The third book actually is going to describe quarantine to a bunch of five-year-olds. So if I can explain it to them, hopefully I can explain it to everybody. 
So here is our contact information. If you have any questions, even if you think they're dumb, please, please, please just give us a call, shoot me an email. We'll be able to tell you, yes, this is something you need to worry about. Or you know what, you can go ahead and wait on this. So let's see, questions coming in. Okay. So this question is concerning fish appetites. Um, have a fish that every once in a while will stop eating for a day and then go back to being normal. This is, again, something you should be worried about. Great question. So yes, fish will have their off days every once in a while. If it's only one day every once in a while, I really wouldn't be too worried about it. Um, certainly if they're, I don't know, just having it either the day after you do a big cleaning or you're coming up on your big cleaning, they just might be the one fish that's more sensitive to the water changes in water chemistry. So certainly I'd check, check your water just in case, especially if it seems to be happening on a cyclical basis. But a fish going off feed for a day or two and then kind of coming back full gusto, I, I don't think that would be such a big problem. But again, if you're worried, we're happy to make more further recommendations. All right, and another question. All right, so this again has to do with koi and color change. So this is a 12 year old koi that used to be red and black, and now it is black and orange with not as much white. So yes, especially when you're buying fish very young. So in the little tosai, the year to two year uh, age group, or even down to a couple months, those colors could change significantly, just moving them to different water chemistry. And those different chemicals interacting with the skin can pull out different pigments. And certainly, again, there's diets. They do make color enhancing diets, which are mostly made for show fish um, going to the shows just at the last couple months before they're, when they're really beefing up. And yes, you can try those. However, if the genetics really aren't there to support the color changes, uh, it's, it's not really going to do a whole bunch. So you can certainly try it and see if it helps. But if not, I wouldn't really worry too much about it. If they're going to be a show fish, then hopefully they have better genetics. It's really one of those tricky things sometimes that some fish just aren't going to respond the way you want them to. Any more questions? Well, thank you so much for attending our webinar on how to recognize disease in fish. If anybody has any additional questions, my email is right there. Please feel free to shoot me an email and we hope to see you next month at our webinar on water quality. So thank you very much. Have a lovely afternoon and evening.